Good morning, Life Point. Let's stand to our feet. Let this be our prayer this morning. Oh, Holy Spirit, move in our hearts, send us with power into the world. Oh, Holy Spirit, move in our hearts, fill us with fire and love for the
fire and love for the world. Amen. He's been coming here for a few years, um, and to witness Tatum's growth over the last few years has been pretty incredible, and Tatum just recently decided to surrender his life to Jesus, amen? <laughs> and uh, a, a little bit different this morning, I wanted to invite Brennan up here with me. Brennan is a Max Impactor. Um, our Max Impactors are students who volunteer in areas of our churches to serve alongside of us and do ministry. And Tatum will be the first to tell you that because of Brennan's impact in his life is so much of the reason that he surrendered his life to Jesus. Um, and so Brennan was asked by Tatum to be a, a very integral part of this morning's baptism. And I just think that is such an incredible testament to our young people um, and to those who are pouring into our kids. So we're going to take a minute to pray. Thank God for Tatum and his decisions as we witness his baptism together. So will you bow with me and let's pray. Dear Jesus... What an incredible morning that we just get to take a minute, God, to realize your goodness and your grace, grace that we don't deserve, but grace that you freely give through Jesus Christ. Tatum knows this morning that it is solely because of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross that we may proclaim that we are forgiven. And so, God, this morning, he is publicly announcing that forgiveness and trust and faith in you through baptism. And God, we are just so thankful to see that this morning in the life of a young person. And so God, I pray for his family. I pray for him that they would grow in wisdom, that his ministry would grow. God, that you would call him to live a life solely for you that brings people to know who you are. And God, thank you for people like Brennan and our Max Impactors that see the importance of pouring into kids and serving at a young age. God, you are just so good. We love you. We thank you this morning for this life that has been saved. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> 
and call to Jesus. Let this be a prayer this morning. There is grace. For the sake of the Thank you for this church. I thank you that we can gather together uh, to proclaim the truths that the world for the entire week tells us are false. But God, we know that you are true. And we, is, we know by the work of your spirit, we know that you empower us for the work of what you set before us. So God, I pray today as we gather together, as we sit here and listen to the ministry of the word, that God, you would use this ministry, that you would use your word to change people, mold them into the image of Christ and send them out for the glory of your name. Jesus, we love you. We praise you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. All right. All right. All right. Well, I'll say this. I am very thankful to be with you this morning. I am, as every morning, uh, Sunday morning, gathering with a local church, uh, proclaiming the truths of God through both song and prayer and in uh, the word. And today we also will be doing communion, which is uh, always a beautiful thing. So uh, if you are a member or a regular attender, I just want to say welcome. Uh, I am so thankful to see you. I am thankful to be worshiping with you again in the Lord's house. Uh, if you are a guest and, and this is your first time here or you've been here and you're like, I'm still hanging out in the back. I don't know if these crazy people, I don't know who they are. Uh, we want to get to know you, okay? We're not crazy. We just love Jesus and everything we do and say. Uh, and, and our hope and desire is to be more like Jesus. And so we want to actually invite you into that, okay? And so if you can see, there's a, if you're in a seat here uh, in the auditorium in the gathering, you can actually see a blue card. That blue card uh, is our Connect card. We want you to fill that out, bring it up to us uh, at the Connect booth so we can actually give you a gift, uh, get to know you. Uh, if you're a Spanish speaker, a buenos dias. Uh, if you are an Arabic speaker, mahraba. That's all I got, okay? Uh, but we're thankful that you're here, and I'm sorry for the person who has to translate for me or for Patrick, because we're both pretty fast. Uh, but if you would fill this Connect card out, either through text or through uh, in the back of the seats, bring it out to us. We'll give you a gift. Uh, we'll introduce you uh, to multiple people so you can get be known. Uh, and we just want to know you, okay? That's all we're asking is to get to know you. We're not going to stalk you. But we do want to know you so that we can walk faithfully with you. Uh, that being said, uh, the other thing is, is for you... Uh, members and regular tenders who tithe and give your offering here. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for being obedient. Let me tell you what that tangibly goes to, okay? In June 3rd through 6th, we have VBS coming up. If you don't know what VBS is, it's basically a free kids camp. Uh, vacation Bible school is what it means. And in that free kids camp, we offer to our community, but also to our body. And so if you have a kid uh, in uh, basically pre-K through fifth grade, 
you want to bring them here. And I'm going to tell you why. Because we're going to be teaching the Bible. We're going to have faithful teachers uh, leading your children in curriculum that will very much be to help them walk in the image of God. And so we preach the gospel. Uh, we talk about disciple making. And we allow for the kids to be a part of that. But not only that, we actually ask you to invite your neighbors and your neighbor's kids, okay? Because we want them to be a part. We want them to hear the gospel. So let me give you a really tangible piece to this. Uh, because of your generosity, because of your being... Uh, your offerings and your tithes, we as a church can offer this free. And this offering basically allows for us as a church to basically both be missional and ministry-minded. So let me say this. Patrick Hood, our lead pastor, actually got saved at VBS, okay? So if you wonder how important it is, the man who leads us as a church, he was actually saved at VBS. My son, who was actually already a believer, made a profession and started walking in obedience and wanted to be baptized. And that's where he made that uh, pronouncement, that he wanted to be baptized and, and actually at VBS. And so you can see how important it is. And so I say all that to say, I want you to sign your children up. Invite your neighborhood children uh, June 3rd through 6th. If you are a member uh, and you want to serve, we would love to have you. We always need more people to come alongside, have gospel conversations, to help the kids. Basically, just to give out snacks, too. So at the most basic level, if you're like, I don't know about any of the rest of it, you can give out snacks, I promise. Uh, but let me say the, the piece for uh, the ones who do not give yet or aren't, uh, aren't walking in obedience. We want you, we're going to lead you in every way as a church to be obedient to Christ's commands and to the word of God. And, and when it comes down to it, we're a steward of God's money. And so if you're not giving already and, and you wanna learn how, we're gonna have the things on the screen that tell you how to do that. Please be obedient, walk in faith, expecting the Lord Jesus to use the little that you give for the glory of his name because that's what he calls us to do in a cheerful way. And I want you to, to do a couple other things. If, if you are uh, a member or a regular tender, I just wanna say, again, it's because of generosity that people learn how to find life by us being pro proclamation uh, ambassadors, but also through your local church. And also we teach people how to live sin. And so because of your generosity, generosity, we are able to do that. And so for everyone else here, as we're sitting in this auditorium, and I got a couple more announcements, then I'm gonna get to the reading of the word. The first thing I want you to do is we're a large church. This is one of our six campuses, uh, if you don't know that. And we as a church gather at, at six locations uh, throughout uh, the year at, at any given Sunday. And what our hope is, is that you are plugged in to faithful ministries to help serve and to all, uh, walk alongside with your children or if for men's or women's ministry. So let me tell you, I want you to get our app. Our app has everything on that's happening at any given time. And Sully is faithful to maintain this thing to ensure. But if you get our app, take, take the look at the logo. It's purple. We want you to get to know what's going on, and let me tell you about some things that are going on really quickly. May 19th, we have First Step. First Step is a place where we, uh, as a church, tell you who we are. Uh, if you're one of those people who are like, are these people crazy? You can come and sit and listen, uh, hear about the conversations of how we became the church that we are today and how we continue to maintain faithfulness. So May 19th, you can come, served, uh, come sign up for that. You also see VBS and camp. If you are a member, like I said, we're looking at uh, people to, to serve alongside of those two ministries. We'd love, you can find that on the app. But all that being said, everything that we have that we're doing as a church is on the app. Now, let me get to the thing that's most important. Let's get to the reading of God's word. If you would, go ahead and stand, if you're able. I'm going to read God's word, and when I finish, uh, if uh, you uh, are able, uh, you will say, uh, in my response, this is the word of the Lord, and you'll say, thanks be to God, okay? So let's go to Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came to them. All authority came to them uh, and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Reading the word today. Go ahead and grab a seat. Thank you for being here uh, on this beautiful Sunday. I, I want to say that Peyton uh, is correct about VBS. Uh, if you have a child that's fifth grader uh, under school age, then they need to be in v vacation Bible school. I did give my life to the Lord. Let me clarify, it wasn't last year, okay, uh, during v VBS, but I did give my life to the Lord at vacation Bible school when I was 10 years old, and uh, uh, it's still one of the greatest. Uh, 
programs that we have for teaching children how to follow the Lord. Some of your kids will give their life to the Lord. Some of them, the seeds will be planted. And some of them will grow in their faith through Vacation Bible School. So if you've got a child, enroll them in Vacation Bible School. We probably still need some of you to serve uh, during Vacation Bible School. So, so jump and get involved in Vacation Bible School. Now, you know, we, we do a lot of talking, right? My, my uh, uh, job is as a pastor, uh, I do a lot of talking. Uh, every week, that's what I do, but we all do a lot of talking. It's been estimated, actually, that uh, we each speak, on average, uh, about uh, enough to fill a 500-page book each week, right? Now, that's a lot of words. If you know how laborious it is to read a 500-page book, that's about the number of words you, on average, speak every week. Now, some of you guys say, you know what, my wife speaks enough to fill an entire encyclopedia every day, right? And so, but... We speak a lot of words, and uh, some of those words are very important, but most of those words we forget quicker than we speak them. They're forgotten quicker than we speak them, but others carry a lot more weight. Lasting, last words carry a lot more weight than all the other words. If you've had the honor of being uh, near someone as they are in the final stages of their life, maybe at what we would call their deathbed, you've heard last words from maybe a grandfather, a, a, a someone, a father, mother, and you know that those last words are very, very important. They carry more weight. Last words are typically lasting words. Uh, just get, let me give you a sample of uh, some last words here. Frank Sinatra, his last words were, I'm losing. Boy, that's, that's, uh, that's sort of sad, isn't it? I mean, Bob Marley, uh, if you know Bob Marley, his last words were, money can't buy life. It's sad to get to that point and realize that money can't buy life. But then uh, there are some incredible last words of, of life. Uh, William Carey, famous missionary, he said, when I die, this was some of his last words, when I die, speak less of William Carey and more of William Carey's Savior. Those are powerful last words. If you remember Joshua in the Old Testament who took over from Moses, his last words were, uh, be strong and courageous. Choose this day whom you will serve, but it's for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. What a declaration. Those are incredible last words. And then, finally, the Apostle Paul. Uh, what an incredible leader in the church. Some of his last words were, I have fought the fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. That ought to be each of our goal, to say those as our last words. I have fought the fight. I have kept, finished the race. I have kept the faith. What an incredible last words. These are very important, but there are no words that are, no lasting last words that are more important, more impactful, more meaningful, more clarifying than the last words of Jesus, not before he died on the cross, but before he ascended into heaven to be with the Father. Now, if you remember, a few, year, a few weeks ago, we celebrated Easter. Jesus coming out of the grave, his resurrection, Post-resurrection, he spent 40 days here on earth before he went back to heaven to be with the Father where he is right now, and he sent the Holy Spirit to invade the lives of all who believe in, in Christ, right? But he spent 40 days before he, before he went back to heaven. In those 40 days, he met with his disciples, and it wasn't just the 12. Actually, if you remember, Judas betrayed Jesus, went out and hanged himself, uh, but then they replaced Judas uh, later, and, and, but it wasn't just the 11 and the immediate disciples. At this time, there were, the scripture tells us, about 500 disciples, 500 followers of Christ, uh, 500 people in the church, so to speak, at this point. Jesus, post-resurrection, spent 40 days meeting with them, talking with them, eating with them, teaching them, challenging them, and then he gathered them all together for one last worship service, so to speak, on the mountain as he was ascended into heaven. And just before he ascended, before their eyes, 500 people, he gave them a commission. We call it the Great Commission. Peyton read it today. It's one of the most preached passages in all the Bible. Outside of John 3.16, just about everyone knows John 3.16. Outside of that verse, this passage is one of the most memorable, the one of the most recognizable passages in all of Scripture. It probably has more sermons preached on it than John 3.16. It's mentioned in more sermons probably than John 3.16. I preach on it a lot, and I mention it a lot because it is the great commission. We talk about the great commission and the great command. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, love, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. We talk about those great commission and great command a lot. They're called great for a reason. Today, we're gonna talk about uh, this commission and where Jesus, just before he jetted back to heaven, his last words, some of his last words to his disciples were, go make disciples of all nations. 
teaching them to observe all that I command you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very, very impactful last words. Very important because it clarifies our mission. It tells what we as the church are about. It tells what your life as a believer is all about. Today, we're looking at Matthew's version. We're also gonna to look at, at Luke's version of this in Acts 1-8 at the end. But here's what you need to know. In the English, this great commission has several verbs. It has namely four, it has go, that's a verb, make disciples, that's a verb, teach, and baptize. Those are all verbs in the English. But this was written not in English, this was written in Greek. And in the Greek, there's only one verb. The verb make disciples is the only verb in this passage. All those other words, go, teach, and baptize, they're participles that modify the verb. Right, in other words, the verb make disciples is what Jesus commissions us to do. All those other participles tell what a disciple does and what he looks like. So here's what we're gonna do today. I want to help you to know what a disciple is. So we're gonna look at the definition of a disciple. And then I want you to know what a disciple does. So we're gonna look at the duties of a disciple. So we're gonna look at the definition of a disciple and the duties of a disciple because this clarifies our commission that Jesus gave, our mission as a church and as believers in Jesus Christ. Basically, let's look at the definition of a disciple. Basically, the only people who use the word disciple are Christians. It's really not a secular word. It's not a use that's used much in the business world. And we do talk about, you know, disciples sometimes, but we, we typically talk more about mentoring and mentors and stuff like that in the business world or in the coaching profession. You know, you've got a coaching tree, you've got all these things. But basically the word disciple is almost used exclusively. You hear it some, but it's almost used exclusively within the context of Christianity and the church. And so it, it is a word that the world doesn't use as much, but in Jesus' day, 2,000 years ago, this was a very, very common word. It was a word of meaning. It was a word that carried a lot of meaning for a lot of people because they used it continuously. Now, uh, let me explain why they used it. Because when we get down to the children, the kids started school about the same age that our kids do today. Your kids are gonna start kindergarten around the age of five-ish, right? Uh, depending on when, what month they were born. They're gonna start kindergarten around five and then they're gonna go to school, graduate from high school when they're around 17, you know, maybe 18, depending on what month they were born. Now, it was pretty much the same back 2,000 years ago in the Jewish world. They would start school around the age of five, and then they would go through three levels of education, much like our kids do, elementary school, middle school, high school. They went through three levels of education, and they, during their educational years, they had a curriculum. Their curriculum was not common core. Their curriculum was not, uh, you know, what we teach today. Their curriculum was radically different. It wasn't the three R's. It wasn't reading, writing, arithmetic. Those are vital. They're very important to life. We need to know how to read. We need to know how to write. We need to know math. We need to know those things. But that wasn't their curriculum. Their curriculum was the Bible. That's what they taught their kids. They memorized the Bible. They studied the Bible. Not only did they study the Bible, but they studied what's called oral traditions. In that day, remember, they didn't have the printing press. So they, they taught things orally. It was oral stories. And so today we would call it commentaries. Commentaries are what this, this theologian, you know, when I study for a message, I'll take commentaries and I study. And part of the study is taking commentaries, going over the passage and seeing how this breaks down and languages, all this kind of stuff and what this theologian says about this. And, and, and that's, what, that's what commentaries are. Well, they studied oral tradition. It was what rabbis said about, like, for instance, the Great Commission, although this was New Testament, so this wasn't there then. So it would have been what rabbis said about Joshua's uh, be courageous statement. Uh, choose you to stay whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Or the Shema, right? Pass, passing along you know, to your children. Uh, it would have been about oral tradition, about what rabbis taught about those things. They studied the scripture. They studied all these things. They would memorize the scripture. And when they got out of school, they, they didn't have the necessarily the formalized uh, grad schools that we do today. If you're going to be a doctor, you had to go on and get some training, obviously. If you had to, you know, be, do some things like that. But they didn't really have these specialized grad schools and all that kind of stuff. And so, but it wasn't 
the parent's dream or ambition for their child to become the next great athlete or the next great doctor or the next great uh, politician or the next great you know, influencer. Their dream was for their son, if they had a son, to be the next great rabbi. That was their dream. And so here's what happened. When kids would get through school, they would apply if they were good enough if, if they were smart enough, if they could make the cut, uh, they would apply to a rabbi to, to, to become one of his Talmudim, or that's what the Hebrew word, one of his disciples. And when they applied to become one of his disciples, the rabbi didn't just automatically say yes. He wanted to know, this guy can make the cut. This guy can represent me well. Because you would be associated with whom your rabbi, Paul. You remember, Paul had a rabbi that he was associated with, Gamaliel, and and, and he uh, was one of the disciples of Gamaliel. And so you would represent that that rabbi well. And so the rabbi said, I'm gonna see if you can make the cut. So he would drill you. He would grill you on this scripture. He would wanna know, how much do you know? He would ask you to quote scripture. He'd say, what does this rabbi say about this scripture? He would just ask you question after question after question. And through that process, he would call out the guys that he would think couldn't make the cut, but the ones that he thought, this guy can make the cut, this guy can represent me well, he would offer an invitation to him by saying, come follow me. That was his invitation. That tells you when Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee, when he looks over at Peter in the boat and James John, and he calls his first disciples, he says, come and follow me. Immediately it says they left their nets and followed him, and you think, why in the world would they just, this guy, random guy walks down the, the, the beach, says, follow me, and they did? Well, because Jesus, he's offering a public invitation Their fathers would have been so excited that they now have a rabbi who is inviting them to come and follow him. So their fathers would have said yes, and they drop everything and they go follow because this is an incredible goal and they're following Jesus. So this is this is what would happen in the process. Now, the goal, the reason that rabbi would grill him and he wanted to have the to make sure who these people were that was following him is because the goal was not just to teach his disciples knowledge. It wasn't just let me grill this knowledge into you. We're gonna teach to the test and you can make sure you pass the test of knowledge. It wasn't just about knowledge. Obviously, knowledge was important. You can't do what you don't know. So knowledge is important, but it wasn't just about knowledge. It was about living this life. It wasn't just about changing your IQ and increasing your knowledge base, but it was about increasing how you lived your life, changing how you lived your life. He didn't wanna just know what his rabbi knew. He wanted to do what his rabbi did. He wanted to become just like him. And so, obviously, uh, the rabbi said, he's representing me, he's becoming like me, I wanna make sure this guy can, can do it. So he would grill him, then he would say, come and follow me, and when, at that point, the disciple would drop everything. Man, he would leave his family, he would leave his job if he had a job, he would leave his, his, his friends, he would leave everything and follow his disciple, uh, his, his rabbi, his disciple, and this wasn't just like when we go to school. If you go to UTC or UT or MTSU or wherever you go to school, It wasn't just, man, I'm gonna go take my classes, then I'm gonna go out at night and do my thing and have fun with my buddies. This was a 24-7 deal. He left everything and he followed him and it wasn't just to learn formally in, in education, it was to become just like this guy. He would eat with him. He would sit with him. He wanted to hold his cup like his rabbi held his cup, hold his fork like his rabbi held his fork. He wanted to become just like his rabbi in every way. That's what a disciple is. A disciple's not just someone who knows. A disciple is someone who does, who lives like his disciple, right? And so that is the definition of a disciple. Most American Christians don't really, most Western Christians haven't really gotten this, it seems. Most Western Christians view Christianity simply as a belief system or a philosophy, but Christianity isn't just about knowing about Jesus It's becoming like Jesus. It's not just about what you believe, it's what you do. It's not just something you think, it's something you live. Here's the measure of spiritual maturity. Some of us, sometimes we measure spiritual maturity in the wrong things. Obviously, if you're spiritually mature, you're gonna know the scripture. You can't grow without knowing the scripture. But sometimes we measure spiritual maturity in, uh, you know, how much scripture do you know? I mean, can you, you know, how many discipleship classes you've been in? Man, you've been through these, you got all these, all these certificates, man, you, you must be mature. That's not how we measure Christianity or, or spiritual maturity biblically. We measure it not just by what you know, but by what you do. Spiritual maturity is measured in, to the degree that what Jesus loves, you love. What Jesus hates, you hate. What, how Jesus thinks, that's the way you think. 
None of us are perfect in that, but you're becoming more like him. That's spiritual maturity. That's what we need. Let me, let me read a passage to you from James. James chapter two is incredible on this subject. James chapter two says this. Two, I'm gonna read verse 14 and then verses 18 through 26. Here's what James says. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? James poses a question here, and James says, listen, you claim to know Jesus, but if you don't back it up with your works, you don't have a faith that'll save you, because if a faith can't change your life, it's not gonna change your eternal destiny. And so James basically says, can that faith save him? In other words, if you say you, have, you know Jesus, but it's not changing how you live, you're probably not really a Christian. That's what James says, your works prove you're a believer. Let's see what he goes on to say, and pay close attention, because it can be really confusing if you don't pay attention, all right? And so uh, when you read this, it ought to cause you to say, hold on a minute, let me dig down deeper and feel what this is. Let me drill down. He says in verses 18 through 26, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Did you hear what he said? He said, hey, don't, don't just tell me what you know. The demons know more scripture than you do, and they're gonna burn in hell for eternity. So it's obviously not what you know, he says. Right, he makes that very clear. He says, do you want to be, sh do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works? See, that can get confusing. Does this say he was justified by works? Was not Abraham justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that day that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. It was faith that saved him, James says, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone, right? That's, when you first read this, it's like, okay, now wait a minute, Pat talks about, you know, you're saved by faith all the time. That's what Paul said. We're gonna explain it because it's, it's very clear, really. And in the same way, was not Rahab the prostitute? Rahab the prostitute, if you remember, as they're going across into the promised land, Rahab the prostitute down in Jericho was justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also, also faith apart from works is dead. Now here's what James is saying. James says to both Abraham and Rahab that they're justified by works as well. That does not mean that your works save you. Matter of fact, Paul says this in Ephesians 2, you remember? He says, for it is by faith, through gra it is by grace through faith that you are saved, not of works, so no one can boast about it. In other words, none of you can say, man, look at me, look at how good I am, look at how much Bible I know, look at, man, God, I I'm, I'm one of God's favorites, he saved me because I did all this. No, he says you can't do that, it was all grace. It's not work. So how did James say you're justified by works? Because he says your works justify your faith. In other words, you can say you're a Christian all day long, but your works will prove whether or not you are truly a believer or not. Your works will prove it. He says, you can talk, but talk is cheap. You can say, I love Jesus, but talk is cheap. You're not gonna be perfect. You're not gonna follow Jesus and do everything Jesus says to do. None of us do, none of us can, because we were born with a sin nature. It's called inherited sin. We got it from Adam. Just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, it says. Death also through one man, G uh, you know, Paul says. Also, salvation comes through one man, Jesus Christ. We inherited sin from Adam. So I was born a sinner, but I also chose to sin. And as a result of my sin nature, uh, I cannot in any way do anything to save myself. Now, this is the most beautiful thing, because what James says is, it's not by your works that you're saved, but your works prove that you are saved. And that's beautiful, because if you could be saved by your works, then you could lose your salvation because of not working. But you can't lose your salvation if you really have it because you didn't do anything for it. Your salvation is not based on what you do, it's based on what Jesus did. So therefore, because you didn't do anything for it, you can't do anything to lose it. It's based on what Jesus did in his works, not on you and your works. That's beautiful. That's why Paul could say uh, confidently there's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. It's done, right? Now, there are a lot of people who say they're a Christian that they're really not a Christian. 
Okay, so understand that. So I do not believe that a true believer can ever lose their salvation based on the teachings of scripture, but I believe that there's a lot of Christians who are truly not a believer who claim to be, if that makes sense. So James says, your works prove what your words say. Are your works gonna back up your faith or not, right? And so, so a disciple James is talking about is someone who does what Jesus did. He believes, he, he thinks like Jesus thought. He, he hates what Jesus hated. He loves what Jesus hated. His life bears that and proves it out. And Jesus spent three years doing this. Think about his disciples. These, these 12 that followed him, it, it wasn't just that going to school with Jesus during the, during the day and going home at night and working a night shift job because you know they had to work because they had families or, or, or going, going out and playing with their buddies or you know going out uh, doing whatever with their buddies and eating. That wasn't what this disciple thing was all about. It was about being with Jesus to learn from him. Remember, he took them aside. He taught them on the mountain. He taught them, but they walked with him. They watched him do everything he did. He would pull them aside and say, you, did you just get what I did? They said, no, no, no. We, what, what did you just do? You know, and he would t- train them. He lived this life in front of them for three years. That's what a disciple does. A disciple is not just somebody with knowledge. It's somebody that says, I, I need to know how to live this, this life. And so, so they followed him. And then at the end of three years, he was murdered. He came out of the grave. He met with them for 40 days. He called them together and said, all right, 500 of them now at this time on a mountain. You've seen me, you've heard me, you know what this life's all about. I'm getting ready to go be with the Father. I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit who's gonna come and empower you. We're gonna talk about that in a moment. To be my witnesses. And, and, and he says, so therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Go, he said, and make disciples. I'm commissioning you to do what I've done. Make disciples who make disciples. And here's what he said. We know it was for every Christian. How do we know that? Because he didn't just call the leaders. He didn't just call the the, the 11 at this point. He didn't just call the 11 together and say, hey, let me tell you, this is up to you. He called all 500, men, women, kids, whatever. He called them all together, and he said, this is for all of you. So it's for every Christian. It's not just pastors. The Great Commission is not just for leaders. It's not just for pastors and ministers. It is for every believer, Every believer, and it is not just for that moment in history. It's not just, guys, we gotta get this, this movement rolling. We gotta get this ball going down there. So you get it started, and then it'll just cruise. It's for all Christians and all ages because Jesus said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age, which means when, when he returns. So he gives us this commission. All believers throughout all time is to go and make disciples. And what is a disciple? A disciple is not just a convert. Our mission is not to make converts, it's to make disciples. Now, making converts is a part of making disciples, right? It's a part of sharing the gospel. It's a part of making disciples. But teaching someone how to live that life is a part of making disciples. So a disciple, our, our mission is to make someone into a disciple, right? The Holy Spirit does that through us, but that's our mission. A definition of a disciple is someone who looks like Christ. Now, what are the duties of a disciple? What are the duties? You know what a disciple looks like. By the way, Christians weren't even called Christians in the New Testament. Did you realize that? They didn't never call themselves a Christian. We call ourselves Christians today. The New Testament Christians never even called themselves Christians. They're called Christians mentioned three times in the New Testament. And it was referring to, they were first called Christians in Antioch. And it's referring to what other people called them. It was typically a derogatory term because it was saying, hey, you're a little Christ in a negative way. They didn't refer to themselves as Christians, but disciple is used almost 300 times in the New Testament. They referred to themselves, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. And in that context, it means I'm a little Christ. I want to be just like Jesus carries a little more weight than checking a box on a, on a census uh, uh, survey that says Christian, Muslim, you know, uh, Hindu, other, whatever, none. It's a little more weight than Christian. My mama was a Christian. I live in a, you know, my, my grandmother was a Christian. I'm identifying with a Christian. Uh, no, 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 it's not that. It's I am a disciple of Jesus. I want to become like Jesus. That's what they were called. That's what a disciple is. Now that you know what a disciple is, what does a disciple do? Well, the duties of a disciple are spelled out, I believe, in the participles. 
And I, and I want to, they're spelled out in a lot of places in scripture, but since we're talking about the Great Commission, Jesus gave us our command before he went back to heaven, and then he told us what to do to fulfill that command. He told us what? Go. That's a part of simple that, that modifies make disciples. Teach. That's a part of simple that modifies make disciples. Baptize. That's a part of simple that qualifies or modifies make disciples. It tells what we do in order to make disciples. And so what do we do? Not just my job as your pastor. What do you do? What do we all do as, as disciples to make disciples? What do we do? Well, I, we, we boiled these things down and, and, and we use language that is pretty catchy, in my opinion, to help you get what we expect of you because what we expect of you as church members is straight from the Bible and this is one of the places that it's found. And, and, and it, it, I preached a message on this a few, I don't know, several months ago, I forget when it was, but uh, I preached a message and it was on our expectations. We boiled them down into four things. Gather, grow, give, and go. Gather, grow, give, and go. Do you remember that? Gather, grow, give, and go. Matter of fact, say it with me right now. You ready? Gather, grow, give, and go. Say it one more time. Gather, grow, give, and go. Really catchy way of saying what these participles are talking about. And let me, let me, let me help you to understand and get that so that you can understand, hopefully, what you've already grasped is what a disciple is. Now, what does a disciple do, which means what should I be doing to become like Jesus, and what should I help others and encourage others to do? What's expected of me from the scripture, just not my church? Because these are not just what we got together and said, hey, let's do this for our, let's expect these things out of our people. It comes from scripture. So let's talk about gather. How do you get gather out of this? How do you get gather? I mean, it does say in Acts that they gathered together daily. I mean, we sit, how do you get gather? Well, I get gather through the word baptize because it's inferred by baptize. Uh, and you say, well, how in the world do you get gather out of baptize? Well, let me explain it to you, okay? Baptism was important then as it is now. Baptism is a public form of identification with Jesus, okay? Back in th that day when someone was uh, uh converting from Judaism to Christianity. Practically everyone converted from Judaism to Christianity in that first century, right? And when they would convert, they would be baptized. It was a symbol. It was a symbol. And they would be baptized, and they were, they were publicly identifying with Jesus as the one who was promised as the Messiah. They were publicly identifying. I am a disciple of Jesus, and that's what we do today, right? We baptize, and you've seen us baptize. We use this, uh, we use this, this tub right here, and we baptize. And when we baptize, we take people under the water. We bring them up out of the water. And what, what is that all about? Uh, most of you know, but some of you are new. So let me explain what that is. When we baptize someone, that's not salvation. It's a symbol. It's a, publicly, it's a public identification with the one who saved them. It's not salvation at all. But it is important because it's a public identification with Jesus. We take someone under the water and we pull them out. Why? Because Jesus was put in the grave, he was buried, and he was come out of the grave, and that's what we do. We bring somebody out of the water. It's a symbol of a death, the death of Jesus, and the death of an old way of life. It's a resurrection to a brand new way of life. That's great. Well, maybe you've seen someone sprinkled. What's the difference in sprinkling and baptizing? Well, I mean, there are some pretty significant differences. Let me, let, me, let me tell those to you because some of them uh, are not invalid, uh, but some of them are, okay? Like if you come from a Catholic background, then uh, Catholics, they sprinkle their babies at birth. That, we believe from Scripture, is a completely invalid baptism because they believe that that baptism washes away the child's original sin, Right? They believe that we're gonna, we gotta baptize this child, sprinkle this child, because it will wash away from Adam. Remember, original sin, inherited sin. We talked about sin came into the world through one man. So they, they understand original sin, but they think that baptism washes away uh, that original sin. And not scripturally, it doesn't. Matter of fact, scripture speaks very clearly that I don't even know where you would come. If, if, if Paul were to write this, he would look at the, the Catholic church in this area and say, where did you manufacture this? I mean, this is not even, you can't infer this from any passage of scripture that this is even close. This is not a doctrine. This is a man-made issue. So that's what Paul would say. So that's a completely, uh, you know, not an accurate form of baptism. It is it, it, not biblically anyway. So, so that's, now the Presbyterians, and I love Presbyterians. Listen, we call our Presbyterians our kissing cousins, so to speak. Crazy way of saying it. 
And, but if I wasn't Baptist, I'd probably be Presbyterian theologically, to be quite honest. Uh, some of you come from a Presbyterian background, they sprinkle their children at birth, or, or, or young. Why? Not, not from a Catholic or Catholic perspective. It's not about washing away their original sin at all. They don't believe that baptism saves that child. Now, I don't do it. This is what separates me from being a Presbyterian. It's called pedo baptism versus credo baptism. Pedo is baptizing a child. Credo baptism is baptizing someone after they give their heart and soul to Jesus Christ, okay? It's called believer's baptism. That's where we are, but I'm not as opposed to the children's baptism. Maybe you were baptized as Presbyterian. That's great. Great, that, that, because all they're saying is we believe in covenant theology and the circumcision was the sign of the covenant and now there's, the circumcision is not the sign of the covenant. Bapt, uh, baptism is, is what they would say. And so they, as a, an infant was circumcised, now we, we baptize infants as a sign that they're in the covenant. And so, so I, I get that. It's a logical inference, but we never see one instance of a child being baptized in Scripture, and we never are commanded to baptize children. But what we do see all through the New Testament is a command, and what we see ex- from an example standpoint is people who give their lives to Jesus Christ and are saved are baptized. So we baptize after someone has given their life to Jesus. We don't sprinkle because the Bible says to dunk. That's what the Bible says. Or does the Bible say to dunk? Well, the word baptizo means to dunk, okay? That's what the word baptism means. It doesn't mean sprinkle, it means dunk. I don't wanna be sprinkled with a little Jesus, I wanna be immersed in Jesus, right? And that's what the Bible says. And so that's why we dunk, and it's a symbol. It's not salvation, but here's what happens, okay? When you do that, when someone's baptizing, they're publicly declaring, I'm with Jesus. I'm following Jesus, they're not gonna be perfect, but they're declaring, I'm following Jesus. It's a public identification with Jesus, but it's also a public identification with the church in Scripture, with the church, which infers some things. It infers a local church has to baptize. They have a pastor. It infers that they're not just, a, not just connected to, but involved in a local church because you're identifying with the church. That's why we believe church membership is vital and important here at LifePoint. There's some churches today that don't do membership any longer, and that's cool, that's great for them. I don't think it's cool, I think it's great for them, but that is not what we believe the Bible teaches. Here's why, okay? I, as your pastor and our elders, one day when we stand before God, we're going to give an account for how we lead this church, right? We're gonna be held accountable. We're gonna be, we're gonna be held accountable for how we lead this church. Are we gonna make a lot of mistakes? Is there gonna be some things we answer for? Absolutely. Are we gonna ever do anything intentionally to do anything to haunt? No, but we're human beings. We're gonna mess up, but we're gonna answer for God. But now here's what we're not gonna answer for. If you're not a member of this church, I'm not responsible for you before the Lord, okay? I'm responsible for how I preach and teach the people who have committed themselves to the Lord and to this local church. I can't be held responsible for Christians all over the world. But I am responsible for what I teach to those who are members of this church. There's a spiritual authority, right, in Scripture, and I'm not responsible for those, our elders are not responsible for those who are not members. Membership is vital, and I believe taught clearly, uh, I mean, inferred clearly in Scripture. And and, and, And so when he says baptize, he's saying you identify with Jesus and you identify and connect to a local church. Immerse yourself in Jesus and immerse yourself in a local church. That means gathering with the church so you're, you're connected to the local church. So that's gather, folks. That's why we gather. But also grow. Gather and grow is under teach. 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 Remember, he said teach. That's one of the verbs. That's one of the participles. I mean, it verbs in English, participles in Greek is teach. We're baptizing, but we're teaching. What are we teaching? Well, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm teaching you the Bible. When you're in small group, you're being taught the Bible. And this is not just teaching. You say, okay, great. That's for you, Pat. That's for my small group. No, no, no. He didn't give it to the leaders. He gave it to every Christian. So every Christian's job is to teach. Now you say, hold on, I'm not a teacher. Well, it doesn't mean formally, like from the stage or formally in a Sunday school class per, per, per se, uh, although it does for some of you, but God didn't gift all of you to be preachers and Sunday school teachers and small group leaders. Matter of fact, you've heard some preachers and Sunday school teachers teach and thought, oh, I think y'all missed your calling, right? 
I mean, and, and that's the last thing we want is people who can't teach formally, teaching formally, or preaching who pr- can't preach, preaching formally. Some of you say, well, what are you doing up there? Look, look, that's not what I mean, but it's, we all are responsible for teaching the gospel. We all are responsible for teaching people how to become a disciple, right? And teaching can't be, it's, it's not summed up and boiled down to formal teaching. That's not what making disciples is all about. Let me, let me tell you about Peyton Bullen. Peyton Bullen came into our church working for, as a fireman. He was a fireman, worked for the fire service. He came into our church and didn't know up from down spiritually, to be quite honest. He came into our church, and he's told this story over and over. He came into this church, didn't know what up or down spiritually. His wife, you know, he, he didn't even want to be here. Some of you, his wife said, no, we need to go to church. He said, all right, that's what he said. And so he came. He and I got connected. He started coming to my house and hanging out. And, man, we would sit at my house, and I started discipling Peyton, uh, along with some other guys. Started discipling Peyton. We'd sit on my deck until 2 or 3 in the morning sometimes, and we would be talking about the Bible and things of the Bible. That was a part of it, but that wasn't just teaching. Let me tell you what else Peyton did. Peyton would come to my house, take my kids to school with me so he could see how I prayed with my kids. He saw how he, he'd come to my house, hang out, see how I interacted with my wife. That was teaching. That's disciple making. You see, guys, that's what it is to teach. It's not just formally, let me sit down and, and teach you some doctrine. It, uh, it, it's teaching the gospel, but it's like, let me show you how to live this life. That's what Jesus did, isn't it? He spent all these years, three years with disciples saying, come, watch me. Now I'm gonna watch you, right? He said, come watch me, then come and do it with me, and then I'm backing out, you do it now. That's what Jesus did. That's what making disciples is all about. It's teaching. And why do we teach? Not just for knowledge, teach to obey. It's about obedience. Going back to James, show me your faith with your works. Back to John, bear fruit. John, John talks about bearing fruit. John 15, eight. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. Look at what it says, John 15, eight. By this, my father is glorified. Listen, that you bear much fruit. Now get this, and so prove to be my disciples. John said the same thing James did, right? James said, hey, prove it by your works. John said, prove it by your fruit that you bear. Your life's gonna prove it out. And so we teach to obey, not just to get knowledge, but to live a life. So we're growing. We're gathering. Man, we're gathering, and in, 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 in just like you're doing today, we're gathering in small groups with groups of dudes, with groups of uh, of. Uh, of, 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 of ladies, you know, your lady gathering with ladies, dudes meeting with dudes, sometimes couples. You're, you're gathering, man, you're, you're studying, you're growing, not just for yourself, it doesn't terminate on you, so that you can pass it on to someone else. That's what we're talking in scripture. Give this to faithful men who will pass it on to faithful men. Right, I mean, older women teaching younger women. I mean, this is, this is making disciples. Right, and so, so this, is, this is a part of the grow part, give, you know, gather, give, uh, gather, grow, give, and go. Give, the scripture teaches clearly. Giving, giving your money. It preaches clearly the tithe. It teaches giving your money, giving your time, giving your life, giving. It's, it's a part of gather, grow, give, and go. Go, he says, go and make disciples. Most people hear the Great, the, the great Commission, and it's go, and they, that's what they hang on to, go. Right, and, and, and that's a participle that, that modifies making disciples. And so, yes, we go. We go, we share the gospel. Uh, making disciples is not just sharing the gospel, but that's definitely a part of it. You share the gospel. You go, and, and, and man, we want you to go. I mean, Jesus said go make disciples, but that doesn't mean just going to Bangkok, going to Brussels, going to Africa, we do all those things, but it means as you go. Acts, or Luke, Luke's version of the Great Commission is an Acts. He wrote Luke, and then he wrote the sequel, and Acts, Acts 1-8 is his sequel to the Gospel of Luke. Here's what he says. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. This is Luke's recording the same thing Matthew's recording here. They're two different people telling the same story. He says, uh, you'll receive power, Jesus said, when, you, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, I want to hone in on this because if I'm going to receive power, that's awesome. I want power. But what I'm receiving power to do is also important. And what does he say? You're receiving power to speak in tongues, to interpret tongues. You're receiving power to manifest things. No, that's not what he says. You're, to heal people, that's not what he says. God, Jesus is the healer. You're receiving power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. 
You see, he gives a Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and Israel. What's he, what, why does he mention those four regions? Because Jerusalem is where they were. Judea was ex- expanding the territory. Samaria went to, uh, uh, to the ends of the earth. It would be like saying to Middle Tennessee, to Tennessee, to the United States, to the world. It's concentric. So did he mean, hey, we should share the gospel and make disciples in Middle Tennessee until all of Middle Tennessee is a disciple and then go to Tennessee and then when Tennessee's all disciples, then go to the United States and then when that's completed, go to, the, go to the world? No, no, no. We do all those simultaneously, not concentrically. We do them simultaneously. That's why we've got people in Brussels and Bangkok and Brazil. That's why we've got people all over because we do them simultaneously. This word could actually be translated as you go, as you go. So this means that as we go to work, as we go to school, as we go to the ball field, to the golf course, we make disciples by sharing the gospel, by living the life, by teaching. So we wanna send missionaries to Scandinavia, but we wanna send missionaries to school. We wanna send missionaries around the world, but we wanna send missionaries to work. We wanna send missionaries to the Balkans, but we wanna send missionaries to the ball field. That's what, we're, that's what our, our objective is, is to make disciples. Now, that applies to all of you as believers. That applies to all of us. This is all of our, it's not just for the pastors, the missionaries, the leaders. It's for all Christians. Every member is a missionary. It's an incredible thing how God's done. He saved you. He didn't save you just to take you to heaven. That's beautiful. I'm glad we get to go to heaven one day and live with Jesus for all of eternity. Uh, but that's not just the, that's the great byproduct, the end result. But he saved us to send us so that we can bring as many people into his kingdom and that he is going to save as, as we can. Now, as we, as we look at this uh, uh, passage, you know, here's what I want, a couple of things as we close out. Uh, you know, if we want to start a movement if we're gonna be a movement, we can't just reach new people. Reaching new people is great, but we can't just reach new people. Uh, we do reach new people. We baptized over 200 people last year. Uh, it, it, we, we, we can't just reach new people. We have to make new disciples. We reach people and make them into disciples who then reach people and make them into disciples. Disciples making disciples. And let me tell you what I'm worried about as your pastor. What, what keeps me up as your pastor, it's not that you become raging atheist. In our world today, that's, that's not my, my, my concern that, we become, that you become raging atheist. My concern is that you do not become a disciple. That you check a box or give your life to Christ, and, but you're not a full-fledged disciple, full-court follower. Christianity is not just about checking a box on a census survey. It's not just identifying as, 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 you know, as a Christian, as a world religion. It is a life that you live that's becoming like Christ. Is that you? That's our commission. Not just for your sake, but so that you'll then help others to become disciples. Disciples making disciples. Disciples making disciples. That's our commission. And today, if you don't know Jesus, maybe the Holy Spirit has convicted you that I need to know this Jesus. If so, then that's the Holy Spirit. That's not me. We would love to talk to you. Come back and see us. If you're online, you can text the word Jesus to the number on the screen, 1-615-551-9800, and we would be glad to help you to know what that means. If you are a believer, then I would help you to understand today that calling yourself Christian is fine. That's our culture, but Know, know the meaning is much more than just a, a moniker on a, on a check, uh, a box on a survey. It is, means that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? All of us have areas of improvement. We always will on this planet. But are you, it's not about perfection. You'll never be perfect. It's about direction. Are you becoming more like Jesus you know, here's your goal. Don't look at yesterday and say, oh man, because you're gonna blow it, right? But look back a year, two years. Am I more like Jesus today than I was a year ago, two years ago? Am I more like Jesus? Am I becoming more like Jesus? Does my works, my fruit bear that out? What do I need to do to become more like him? That's a disciple. And are you making disciples? That's your commission. Now, we're gonna, today we're gonna close by, by taking communion. If our deacons can come ahead and and come on down and grab the, the, the elements and hand them out. And I tell you all the time, some of you say, man, you tell us this all the time, Pat. We got new people all the time. So let me explain really quickly what this is. Jesus was arrested 
murdered, beaten badly, murdered on Friday, arrested on Thursday. Thursday night, he was celebrating Passover with his disciples. Passover was the celebration of how God brought them out of Egypt through the, the shedding of the blood of the lamb, putting on the doorpost. He's doing that, but he changes it all up. He takes a piece of bread, breaks it, says, this is my body. He takes wine and he, he passes it around, said, this is my blood. And what's he doing there? What he's doing is he's transforming the Passover meal of the old covenant into the Lord's Supper of the new covenant. He, he's telling us, and he says, when you do this, do it to remember me. What he's telling us is, I want you to do this to focus, to force us to remember his broken body and his spilled blood. He was the lamb of God who takes away our sin. He's the lamb that the Passover lamb pointed to. And he doesn't just redeem us from Egyptian slavery. He redeems us from the slavery to sin. And so he set that up that night so that we would always do it. So this is for believers. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you can take one of these things and we're gonna remember his death, his body that was broken and his blood that was spilled. I'm gonna give you just a few moments uh, to, as they're passing this out, to examine and think about your life. Paul told the Corinthians that they were doing it frivolously without any thought. He said, don't do that. So I'm gonna give you just a few seconds here to, to contemplate and examine. Is there any sin you need to confess? Is there anything you need to, to do? And then thank Jesus for his broken body and spilled blood that saved you, redeemed you, that made you a part of the family of God in a, such a way that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Would you do that right now? Father, we thank you for your amazing grace. We thank you that you are so good. Thank you that you saved us by your work, not ours, and therefore we are completely secure if we have truly given our heart to you. Nothing can take us from you, you tell us that. Nothing can snatch us out of your hand. God, that wouldn't be the case if it was our work that saved us, but it wasn't, it was yours. Thank you. Thank you for giving your body, sacrificed, broken. Thank you for your life that was given, represented by the spilled blood. We love you. God, as believers in Jesus Christ, as disciples, help us to remember and be motivated to become more like you in the areas, all areas of our life. Lord, as those early Jewish kids studied the Bible as their curriculum because they knew this is where life is, help us to do the same. We love you and we praise you. We thank you for your grace in Jesus' name, amen. That night, Jesus took that bread and he broke it. And so there's a, a to tear open the bottom of your cup, take that little piece of bread just as a symbol and remember how his body was broken, torn apart as he was suffering the wrath of God poured out on him that should have been mine for my sin, but he took it for me. If you're a believer, if you're a disciple, remember that. Take and eat and remember. He took that wine and he passed it around and said, this is my blood. It wasn't his blood, it was wine. It was a symbol. And he was talking about his life, blood, is life, life's in the blood. Leviticus tells us that. He gave his life because life was the price for sin. Somebody had to die. He lived a perfect life and died, so you don't have to. Physically, maybe, Jesus doesn't return, but spiritually, if you're alive in Christ, you'll never die. You'll be with him. And that night when he said, this is my blood, he was referring to that. Remember his death that bought you life. Drink and remember. I hope we today leave remembering our commission. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, today the Holy Spirit has 
been speaking to you, come and see us. If you are, I hope the Holy Spirit begins to reveal to you areas of your life that you need to continually become more like him. Some areas you're doing great, I know, but other areas you got some ways to go. Why do I know that? Because that's me. And so let's become more like Christ every day. Learn, gather, give, grow, and go. Gather, grow, give, and go. Gather, grow, give, and go. Become more like Christ every day. Church, we're gonna ask you to stand. Travis sang a long time today. and He, he, he sang way too long, so we're just gonna let you leave, okay? It wasn't the preaching, it was the singing. So uh, y'all just go out. Travis will do better next week, okay? So uh, y'all go have a great time, okay? Hey, church, we love you. God bless you. Go have a great time. <laughs>